okay. Since I have no one really to share these um, real life experiences with, I'm certainly not going to go talk to a psychiatrist because they'd probably just look at me like I'm just some dirty sex worker. And I don't need that. I don't need that kind of judgment. And I don't need to pay someone whatever it is they charge, a couple hundred bucks an hour probably, I imagine, just to ramble on. I mean, I can do that here, right? And maybe some of you out there might actually care about what I have to say. So I guess everything's a numbers game. Um, that's how I look at it. Everything in life is a numbers game. If you do something enough times over and over and over again, and whatever that is you're doing has certain risk to it, well, of course, then it's only a matter of time before those risks actually show up and you have to live through the consequences and hopefully they're livable and you live to tell and like I did. Um, I'm not trying to be over dramatic or anything, but I think the potential there was there for me to actually have really, I don't even want to say, but um, I mean, when, when a client has a gun in his room and it's like on the headboard, you know, like a, there's like a shelf there and his hand is only literally inches away. Like this is the headboard. There's a shelf. There's a gun here and his hand is literally inches away. Um, that should concern, that would concern anyone. And I don't, I was, I was so terrified, but I think I'm getting way ahead of the story. So I guess I should start from the beginning. I got a call for an out call. Um, it wasn't a call that I normally would get or take because Ever since the ecosystem of the escort sites have been disrupted because of a lot of sites going down, and um, since this ecosystem of sites have, has been interrupted and everything is like all thrown up in the air and clients just land wherever they will, um, yeah, I mean, I'm busier, but that's only because I'm seeing clients now that I otherwise probably never would even see. I never did advertise on Backpage, hardly ever, ever, ever. It was like way too expensive. It's like five bucks every time you post and your post lasts for like five minutes. I'm not kidding. Like you post an ad and it's like gone in five minutes. It's like 10 pages down where no one's going to find you. So basically you're paying every time you post five dollars, five dollars, five dollars. So if you do that like all day, I mean, you can imagine. I mean, I think I think it actually went up to like seven or eight dollars. I don't even know. But that's why I never really used Backpage. But since it's gone... All the clients that used to be there have just scattered all over the place. And I'm getting a, lar a large amount of those clients that I otherwise wouldn't get. So, yeah, on one hand, it's good. But on the other hand, it's bad because I'm getting a lot of clients that I normally wouldn't see. And that's only because I need. I feel like I need to make my money while I still can before something else happens. Like, And they take down some more sites or some other sites go away or whatever. I don't know. I'd like, I live in a very precarious situation, a uh, very unstable situation where I never know from day to day what's going to happen with my rights as a worker, as an adult worker. I never know how many more rights they're going to try and take from me to make my work even more dangerous or more impossible. I guess in a way, I'm just glad I can still advertise and I'm not out on the street yet because if they take down all the sites what else can you do but go out on the street or work in a bar hand out your card or make a business card or you know what i mean like i don't want to get off topic but i'm just saying so okay since the ecosystem has been disrupted in the sex work industry and i'm getting all these clients and i got this out call and he didn't have any references but you know usually if they'll give me their real name and if i can find them on the people search site that I use. And if I can find them and I can find their address and I can check out their address and stuff, usually I'm okay with that if I'm going to their house. He sounded nice enough. He didn't sound mean or crazy. Um, 
I didn't hear any weird noises in the background or anything strange. Everything seemed normal. The only thing that did kind of seem odd is that he kept saying that, um, well, he didn't, this isn't really that odd because a lot of people don't know. He kept saying, well, I don't know what to expect. I don't know what to expect. And I'm, and I'm like, well, I can't talk about stuff, but, um, you know, just, I'm sure, you know, everything will be fine and yeah, we'll have a great time. And, but then he kept saying it and kind of would chuckle and I kind of made me feel like, oh, he's just like some harmless guy. He doesn't know anything. He never did this before. And I'm thinking, you know, at least he has a good attitude about it. He's just kind of chuckling about it, you know. Okay. So I, I, I go ahead and I run his, his phone number and I find his address. It's correct. And it's a night I Google map it and I look and I'm like, oh, okay. That, that looks like a nice house in a good area. Everything looks good. You know, it's not like he lives out in the middle of nowhere, like where there's no people around. And it's not like he lives in a shack. That's, I mean, I've actually had clients <laughs> give me their address and I Google it. And it's like, you know, I, this actually happened a couple of weeks ago and it looked like an abandoned shack. And I'm thinking to myself, there's no way I'm going to go to some abandoned shack. I'm really careful. You know, that's why I do all this. And I, I, I take the time to, to research people and see where they live and what their house looks like as much as I can anyway. Okay, so everything checked out okay. I drive there, I get there, everything seems normal. There's neighbors around and now this is where it gets weird. So I walk up to his door and I knock and then I start hearing dogs like huge, they sound like German shepherds. They sound like very, very large and kind of vicious actually. They're barking very kind of aggressively and I didn't ever saw them. I, I think he probably must have put them away somewhere. I don't know where he put them, probably outside. I don't know, but I could hear him really barking. And then, and then all of a sudden, then I didn't hear them barking. And then, I, then he comes to the door. And then, you know, he's just like an older guy. I don't know, maybe in his, not that old, but like maybe late 50s or something. Kind of bald, kind of um, like um, five o'clock shadow and kind of heavy, a little heavy set. And he's like, he opens the door and he's like, oh, okay. And oh, what are we gonna do here? And I'm like, a hug and a kiss? Cause I'm just like, you know, I just wanna make sure that he's comfortable and he knows that I'm friendly and everything. So, you know, he then he let me in and we hugged and we ki I kissed him on, I gave him a peck on the mouth. And then uh, I think he, I believe he asked me if I wanted something to drink. And I said, oh, no, I got to drive later. Of course, I don't drink anyway. But I said, but water's okay. And then he gave me the water. And I noticed this place was very messy and kind of dirty. And I really didn't want to stay in the front room because it, I felt like it'd be more comfortable in the bedroom. So I said, why don't we just go upstairs now then? And so he's like, okay. And we get up there and then the other thing, which is really kind of odd is the lights were completely off and it was really dark in there. And this is still kind of like early evening. And, and, and I kind of got kind of scared a little bit because I was thinking, what if, what if this is like an abandoned house? Like what if the lights don't even work up here or something? I don't know. It was just seemed odd. It was so dirty and there was like trash and clothes everywhere. I mean, I think, I think maybe if, if I wasn't so nice, I probably would at that point just ran out the door with the money, but no, I'm not, I'm not like that. But I think a lot of people might actually probably at that point would have turned around and said, Oh, I got to go, uh, you know, put the money away or something and probably take a lot of people probably would have took off at that point. Cause it, it was really dirty. I'm not kidding. Like, you know, I'm not the cleanest person in the world. I know I can let things go, but this was like a little over, over the top as far as, you know, filthiness, his room, it's just, there was trash on the ground and clothes and I don't know, junk everywhere. But anyway, I did not see the gun. I think if I would have saw, there was like a headboard with a shelf and there was a gun up there. If I think, I think if I would have seen that the lights were all off, I didn't see it. I think if I would have seen that right when I walked in the place, I think I would have gotten really scared and I probably would have just um, said like, you know what, maybe it was better. We stay downstairs. <laughs> Cause, um, yeah, 
that was scary. I don't know what I would have done if I would have saw it, but it was too late. By the time I saw the gun behind the headboard right here on top, by the time I saw that, I already had my clothes off and I was already kind of like in the middle, not in the middle, middle, but like in the beginning of the middle of the session. And I couldn't stop, you know, I couldn't just like say, oh, um, by the way, let's just, you know, go downstairs now. I couldn't do that. I felt like if I, if I upset him, see, th this is the other thing I found out. He actually um, was crazy. Um, he had been in the Iraq, what, what was that, the first war? I asked him later and he said he was in the war and I asked if he had PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And of course he does. All Pretty much all veterans have that. Um, he was a pilot. So we didn't get too much into that. I didn't talk to him too much about that, but I realized that he did have um, a temper. And even though he seemed on the phone nice and he seemed easygoing on the phone, he was not that easygoing. Um, there was a few times he kind of snapped at me because I'm very careful and I don't let clients just do whatever. It's not like, you know, where, where you can just do whatever you want. No, I have limits. I have, you know, safety guidelines I go by and he got upset because I told him, you know, if he wanted to put his finger in me, he had to put a condom on his finger and he got very upset about that, you know, and um, I can't just let people put their dirty fingers in me. I, I'm, I don't want to get no yeast infections or anything or germs and his hands weren't you know, nice. They were rough. Um, he'd probably been touching his dogs earlier or something, you know, who knows? His hands were not, were not smooth either. They were rough and he did it anyway. And it hurt me. And that's, I think, I feel that was very abusive. And I feel like the fact that he had the gun right there, I felt like that was very abusive and inconsiderate at, at the, at best. At worst, he was planning on using it on me if, I pissed him off enough because he had a, he was snapping and I was, I was thinking if this guy completely snaps, then, and I'm thinking this the whole time, then it's over. This is, this is probably gonna be my last client ever. Like I will no longer, I will not make it home. So I just kept talking and talking and talking the whole time because I was so scared. I just kept trying to keep his mind on sex and not, not, not stray in any direction whatsoever other than, than sex, because I was so afraid of, if I said one thing wrong, went off topic, I did never, would never mention anything about the gun. No way. Cause I feel like if I did, he would have got angry. I just pretend like I never saw it, basically. Um, I probably spent more time with him than I wanted to. I was sweating and I was so nervous and it was kind of warm there, but it wasn't that warm, but it was. And I said, um, why don't we continue? This is like almost like towards the end of our hour. I'm like, I already been there way too long. I was so afraid that if I said something like I, I needed to get going, that he would get mad. So I kind of overstayed. And I said, um, why don't we, you know, continue our session um, downstairs where it's a little bit cooler. And I was really sweating because the, there was a gun right there and his hand was like this behind his head. And there, all he had to do was reach up and grab it. And actually during, there was during a point during the session when I, I asked him to scoot down because I, I said that um, we were too close, like my head, my head was going to you know, hit the headboard. And um, he kind of acted like he didn't want to, like, you know, like he really wanted to be close to his gun. And um, I don't, I don't know, like, this is really crazy. So I, I realized at some point in the session, I realized that he thought it was going to be a relationship. And I went along with it. Um, I just kind of went along with it. And 
I told him, okay, because he wanted to see me again as a girlfriend, not, not to pay me. And this guy is nuts. Okay. Like, why would I be interested in this person? This, this is a client. This is not a dating situation. This is supposed to be a professional situation. And, and he was taking it wrong. Okay. So I just kind of went, went with it. I didn't want to upset him or say anything. He would get mad or angry or anything. So I went along with it. I got home to make a long story short. I got away and um, he's been calling me and he's been up really upset. I have not answered any of this. I will not answer. I got his number and I, I see, I can see on my ID when he's calling and to tell you, she's, I've been so scared that of him. I just, I, I haven't even really been answering my phone today much because I, I keep thinking he's going to trick me and, and um, try to get me to go over there again. And he, he keeps leaving all these messages and I keep thinking, well, what if he changes his number? So I just really haven't been answering my phone. And I listened to his messages. Well, the last one I didn't, but I listened to a few of them and he was like crying almost like saying, please, I need you. I, and I'm not going to say, tell you what my work name is, but then he would say my work name. Oh, and he also wanted to know my real name when I was over there. And there's no way I would tell him. No way. That's a, that's like crossing the line right there. That's very inconsiderate. I have my reasons why I don't tell people my name. So anyway, yeah, I, in a way, like listening to him crying on the, on the phone, begging me to call him to see him again, it kind of made me feel a little sorry for him. And I kind of wanted to give him the benefit, but no, because yes, he did cross the line several times. And yeah, that is very disrespectful having a gun up there. Like he should have put that away. And yeah, his house was really, really filthy. And yeah, he was crazy. And there's no way I was going to see him again. But then I was thinking about it. Not that I would see him, but I was thinking, where, like, where have I heard this situation? Where, because it seemed kind of like, it started seeming kind of familiar. Like, not that this has ever happened to me before, but then I remembered. And not that I watch television a lot. I used to when I was younger, but there was this movie called Star 80. And uh, it reminded me of that because the guy was like crying on the phone. Oh, please just see me one more time. Then, you know, then we can break up or whatever. And then he was crying and then she fell for it. And then she actually got killed because, yeah, he um, he didn't want her to break up with him. So he killed her. And and that reminds me exactly of this, that he actually thought we were going to have a relationship and I was going to go to Cancun with him. And there's no way I would ever do that. But yeah, I guess that's it for now. Take care.